They are more than just names. More than blocks of stone set in rows. More than memories. They are our brothers and sisters. Our parents and our children. Friends, loved ones, and even strangers who believe that we were worth fighting for. That we were worth dying for. They stand for justice. For courage. For heroism and fearlessness in the face of danger. They stand for the brave men and women who selflessly answered the call and gave their very lives for the cause of freedom. Let us never take their sacrifice for granted, but instead remember with gratitude those who have served. Today, tomorrow, and every day thereafter. By the grace of God, if we walk upon free soil, if we breathe in the sweetness of liberty, let us give thanks, let us honor the fallen, and let us never forget. Good morning. I am uh, Eric Christopher Reese, a retired Sergeant Major with 30 years on active service in the Army with two tours in Iraq. Memorial Day, originally known as Decoration Day, started just after the Civil War when various towns and cities had begun holding springtime tributes to the countless fallen soldiers, decorating their graves with flowers and reciting prayers. Today, the meaning of Memorial Day has become lost throughout the years. Some see it as a day to gather together for a barbecue and consume adult beverages. Others will visit cemeteries or memorials holding family gatherings to remember the family members who, did, who died on service, in service to their country. I'd like to honor and remember all the military members who sacrificed everything to guard and protect our country. Please stand with me. Join me in a moment of silence as we honor the fallen. Thank you, and may God bless America. Now, let's join together as Brother Meeks comes as he leads pre-service prayer.
minutes from now about 45 minutes from here there'll be thousands of people who are going to just watch cars go in circles and cheer and go wild and spend a whole bunch of money can I tell you we're in the presence of almighty God for the next two minutes I want you to lift your hands and I want you to thank him for what he's done for you. Come on. I don't want you to ask for anything. I just want you to magnify the one who's worthy. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Come on. I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your power. I thank you for bringing me through some stuff. I thank you for my family. I thank you for my blessings. I thank you, Lord, that you are here and you are all. so grateful on this Sunday that he came to be with us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We magnify you, Lord. You're worthy. You're worthy of the highest praise. I realize that this is a holiday weekend. Brother Reese, thank you so much for helping us honor those who have fallen. It was so spot on. But just because it's a holiday weekend, it's not a waste service. It, it, uh, 
I don't know, honey. I think we'll probably grill tomorrow. But you know what? I'm going to have church today. <laughs> Brother Neil, I'm going to have church today. I, I came to church today. You can return to your seats for just a moment. We're going to receive our tithe and offering. Our ushers are going to come. But I have some, an exciting announcement for next Sunday. Everyone say children's revival. You can stay standing. You're not, I don't have much to say before we're going to receive an offering. Just stand up. Come on. Come on. Next Sunday is children's revival. Turn to your neighbor and say casual Sunday. In fact, Victor, it's so casual. You can even put on a superhero shirt for next Sunday. All right? Is that all right? If you're offended at that, there's a prayer line that will be right over here, right after service. I, we want you to come casual next week, and we want to encourage our kids because they are important to this body. Now, I'm always very transparent with you, so let me tell you. I thought about us just having a cutesy little children's revival in the back and let them do their thing and us just have regular church. But you know what? I think that tells our kids that they're not worth enough to have a Sunday for. And so they're going to be in here. They're going to be highlighted because they are our future. Yep. And plus, Brother Jamie, we could come casual next Sunday. No tie. Oh, you thought today was casual Sunday. I, I, and last, I, I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. By the way, thank you for cleaning out that shed yesterday. And some of these young men, we appreciate that very much. This week, we had delivered to our church something we've needed for a long time. We got a new lift for our church. We've been renting them for years. We have a lift now. We thank the Lord for it, and uh, God is just doing wonderful things. And know that when you give to the sanctuary in your tithes and offering and through your vision giving, it doesn't all just stay here. In fact, this weekend I happen to be with a church planner, and we're going to be sending an offering to this church planner. And, you know, when you have a, a small congregation Imagine what that's like to pay the bills. And you realize that this congregation is helping churches all around the world. We're, we're, we're helping in Africa. We're, we're helping over... Because that's, that's what God intends for the body of Christ. All right? So whenever we give to the Lord, is an exciting time. The Bible says to give joyfully. Let me mention one more thing. For those of you who have sponsored a camper this year, I want to say thank you. I will have the final numbers, and trust me, if there's any other campers who need to be sponsored, all of our children will be going to camp who want to go. <laughs> Brother ID, I've, I've said this before, but I was sponsored as a camper, and it was that camp where I got a call of God in my life. And so maybe it is your son or daughter, and I don't know what their calling is in their life, but we want them to go to church camp and have a life-changing moment. And so if you are here and this year your child needs a sponsorship, hey, we understand everything's inflation, everything's higher. Just know we got you covered. And if you're here and you want to sponsor a camper, you just put under vision giving and put camper. Each camper is $190 and you just put that under vision giving. So we already have several that have come in and I want to thank you for that. Let's bless our offering and then we're going to dismiss to give and then to spend a few minutes with each other. Lord, I thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. One more time in your presence. I thank you, Lord, for allowing us to give, to sow into your kingdom. We ask you, Lord, to bless our giving today. Bless the rest of this service in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. amen. Let's give joyfully. Let's greet each other in Jesus' name.
One more time with every hand lifted, say, Holy Spirit, God, we welcome you into this house. Lord, I welcome you into my life right now, God. All I want is what you want, God. If that's your prayer, can you just let him know in your own way, God? I want your Holy Spirit to saturate my life. God, I want your Holy Spirit to overshadow everything that I do. God, I want to be so consumed with your presence, God. (laughs) Overwhelm me in this house today, Jesus. Oh, I praise you. I worship you. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. As you make your way back to your seats. There is a real and tangible presence of the Holy Ghost in this house. Mm. Whatever you come into this place needing today, whatever situation you came in here dealing with, by the time you leave, I believe that God can help you. God can give you strength and God can give you peace and God can set you free. And the Holy Ghost can move in and take control of every situation that you're dealing with. (laughs) As you're turning to Acts chapter 2, I give honor to Pastor and Sister Johnson. Amen. We have amazing leadership in this church. Amen. And I'll take my liberty here a little bit and say they aren't just people that stand up here on Sunday and preach the Word of God, but they are people that they reach out. They're sensitive to the Holy Ghost. When they know you're going through something, you don't even have to tell them most of the time because God will speak to them and they will begin to minister to you. Even when you don't know that anybody else knows, God will speak to him and to Sister Johnson, and I am so glad that I have a pastor that is sensitive to the voice of God. Amen, and we love you. It says in Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I I don't know about you, but there's times I come in and that's exactly what I'm wanting to take place. I'm wanting a book of Acts experience where the Holy Ghost moves in and the tongues like as a fire move in and everyone that's in the place leaves filled with the Holy Ghost. When you have a true book of Acts experience, can I tell you, everyone in the room leaves full of the Holy Ghost. And they were there, and they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how do we hear every man in our own tongue? wherein we were born. Skip down to verse 12 and it says, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? But others, mocking, said, these men are just full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be it known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, 
seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old young men shall dream dreams. And your old men shall see visions. And upon your servants and the handmaidens, I will pour out of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. The mocker said, Ah, these people are crazy. These people are just drunk. These people have had a little too much alcohol. (laughs) Peter stood up and said, oh, no, no, no. I love that he didn't say they weren't drunk. He just said they're not drunk as you suppose. They haven't had enough time in the day to be drunk yet, but but there's something overshadowing them, and there's something that has made them intoxicated. There's something that has overwhelmed them to the point that they begin to act different than they did before, and they begin to behave themselves in ways that made other people think that they were crazy and they were out out of place. And so I want to preach on this thought today under the influence under the influence can we put our bibles down and lift our hands toward heaven and ask that god would speak to us in this house jesus lord we feel your presence in this house right now and god i'm praying lord that every heart would be open and receptive to what is being spoken in this house today god Lord, I know I've heard from you, and I know that I'm in your will right now, God. Now let me decrease. God, let me fade to the shadow so they can hear your voice. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. When I began to felt the Lord drop this thought into my spirit, I, I began to think about influence. And influence by definition is simply the power to have an effect on people or things. To affect or change how someone or something develops, behaves, or thinks. And so whether we want to admit it or not, we are all under the influence of something. There are external or internal pressures that compel us to behave in certain ways, to act a certain way, to think a certain way, to say certain things. When we think of in the natural, when we think of the term under the influence, we automatically go to substance abuse or alcohol, drugs, substances, nicotine, chemicals that affect us and we are controlled by it. But when we really narrow it down, we are all under the influence of something. We have the influence of culture, the influence of fame, the influence of a career, the influence of fear. There are those in this room like myself that are workaholics where you think to yourself, I'm not successful enough. My parents didn't have him much, and I'm, going, I'm, I'm not going to turn out like they did, so I, I'm just going to work and work and work and work to do whatever I can to try to prove how important and how successful I am. I'm going to work myself to death just to prove to everyone else that I am a success. You have the influence of peers, The influence of unrealistic expectations. (laughs) The influence of sin. The influence of lust. The influence of a desperate situation that you may be going through right now. That is controlling your mind, your thoughts, your actions. The influence of a dream or something that you feel like you want to succeed in in the future. And the influence of the spirit. Whatever you are under the influence of will control your actions. Some of the most successful people in the world had very hard beginnings in childhoods. 
They come up under extreme poverty or extreme abuse and that, that shaped them and that molded them and that influence in their life gave them what they needed to push and to get to where they are because they made up their mind, I'm not going to allow that to change, affect me. I am going to push until I get through and over the obstacles that were set in my way. That opposition you're feeling right now in your life, can I tell you, that could be the way God is trying to push you and to give you that extra oomph that you need to be successful in the kingdom of God. There are those in this room that are trying to live a Christian life without selling out to the intoxicating power of the Holy Ghost. We wonder why it's so hard to live for God on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and I was told my whole life when I was growing up, and I used to laugh at it a little bit, but they would say, well, if you try to live for God easy, it's going to be hard. But if you live for God hard and you're sold out to it. You know what? This living for God really isn't as difficult as people make it out to be when you're truly sold out to the cause and the kingdom of Christ. <laughs> Think about this. The God, the Almighty that fills all time and space, the God who controls the whole kind, confines of eternity lets me choose if he can fill my heart and if he can control my life. He can control everything in the universe, but he looks at us as humanity and as human in our will, and he says, you know what? I control everything else. I control the weather. I control what governments rise and what governments fall. I control it all. But when it comes to you as an individual, I'm giving you the choice of whether you want me to feel and control your life. If you want to do it your own way, I'll let you do it your own way. But if you'll let me, if you'll let me control your life, if you'll let me fill you with my spirit there's something powerful that will take place in your life he's wanting us to become intoxicated with his presence because intoxication doesn't just happen intoxication is a choice when that drug addict goes out if he doesn't put that needle in his arm and shoot that drug into his vein he does not become intoxicated that intoxication is a choice it's a choice we have to make of whether we allow God to overwhelm us and consume us or not it's up to us as individuals you see brother Buck if you've been around here to any amount of time at all I'm sure you've heard brother Buck share his testimony about being an alcoholic for years and 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 he couldn't go through hours without a drink and he goes out to a field and he sits there on the tailgate and he's got two 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 fists of whiskey and he and he looks and he says God he downs the first one and he looks and he said God mom always told me if I ever get into into any trouble to call on you and if you're real, I'm going to down this last fifth of whiskey, and then I'll never drink again. And he said he heard a voice behind him say, if I'm real, why do you need that one? It said he took that bottle of whiskey and he threw it against the ground and shattered it and he's never had a drink again. Why? Because that is the power of God and the delivering power of the Holy Ghost. When you really want to live for God, God will empower you. It doesn't matter what the addiction. It doesn't matter what your situation. God wants to consume every aspect of your life. <laughs> We need to become intoxicated with his presence. <laughs> the, the term intoxicated, we think of it as the definition of being affected by alcohol or drugs, especially to the point where you, your physical and mental control is remarkably diminished. But can I tell you, there's a second definition to intoxicated, and it says emotionally excited, elated, 
exhilarated as by great joy or extreme pleasure. When you get into the presence of God, you don't have the same intoxication that you get with a drug. No, this is better than any drug. This is better than any high that you can get out in the world. This is extreme joy. This is extreme pleasure. This is the power of God that says, I will give you greater than you've ever experienced. Well, you know, I, I, I just don't think I can do that. I don't think I can get emotionally excited. I, I don't think I can worship the way other people worship. I, I don't think I can dance and really feel that freedom in this presence. I, I just don't think I can do that. That's not my nature, can I tell you? When you look at your life and you, when you come down here to the front or you're in your seat or you're in your car by yourself and you begin to lift your hands and you begin to worship God and the enemy brings condemnation into your life and tells you you're not worthy because of your failures and because of your mistakes and because of the things that you've done, you can't worship God because of all that. That is not God. That is condemnation from the enemy. And Romans 8 tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit and I know this could get controversial right now but bear with me condemnation is in your hands not God's If we feel condemnation, it's because we're living under the influence of the old man and we're living under the influence of the flesh. But when we get under the influence of the Holy Ghost, that condemnation turns to conviction and conviction draws you closer to God. Condemnation pushes you away from God. But if you ever feel, God, I'm sorry for this sin and it draws you to him, that's not condemnation. That is conviction and it's the way God wants to pull you in. It's when you say, God, I can't worship you because of my failures. That is condemnation. It's pushing you away from the presence of God, and it's our choice. Whether we listen to the voice of condemnation or whether we get in the spirit and say, God, I want your conviction to guide my life. I want your conviction to pull me closer to you. You see, Jesus told the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, he looked at her when they brought him to, when the Pharisees brought her to him and said, we caught this woman in the act. And he just got down and began to write on the ground in the dirt with his finger. And he stood up and he said, woman, where are thine accusers? She said, Lord, there is none. And he says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Can I tell you that the condemnation is not what Jesus does? Jesus wants to love you. Jesus wants to forgive you. That doesn't mean that you have a license to go out and live any way you want and do what you were doing when you got brought to Jesus. No. What he said was, I'm not going to condemn you. Now I'm going to give you the power to go out and to stop sinning the way you were sinning. When you get into the presence of God, there's something supernatural that happens and his presence overwhelms you. And he says, I'm not going to condemn you, but you can't keep living the way that you've always lived we are all under the influence of something whether it be substance media situation of this world the spirit of God we are all being influenced by something and we need to get a hold of a God called purpose and a God called dream that comes directly from the inspiration of the Holy Ghost can I tell you the poorest person in this room is not somebody without money. The poorest person in this room who is someone who is not under the influence of a dream from God. Can I tell you intoxicated people are not concerned with what others think around them. <laughs> are we under the influence of people's opinions in our past? Or are we under the influence of a God called dream? Because if you have a dream from God, you won't worry about what everybody else thinks and you won't worry about the opinions of others because your only goal is to please him and so that God can fulfill what he wants to fulfill in your life. You know what we need? 
We need to get to the place that we are pursuing and we are following after a dream from heaven. Not what our flesh tells us, not what the world tells us, but I want to be consumed and influenced by the power of God and what he wants for my life. The fire of the Holy Ghost should take over every part of your life. Hebrews 12 says it, and I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. It says, since we are receiving the kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring, or the King James says, a consuming fire. We have got to get to the place in this last day that we are so consumed with revival that we wake up thinking revival. We go to lunch thinking about revival. We go to bed thinking about revival. It needs to consume every aspect of our life. When we're at work, we're not just fulfilling the job. We're looking around of how can I make an impact for the kingdom? Who can I reach out to today? Who can I witness to today? Because when you are consumed with the the things of God it just becomes natural it becomes who you are because you are full and intoxicated by it if we want real revival it's going to take us being inconvenienced your church should inconvenience you I know this isn't popular I know that this isn't what we want to hear. But last night as I was here at the church praying, God began to show me some things and I began to battle some things in the spirit sitting right here on this front step. And it's where we are with things that we are battling as a generation in, in this church and in the church in general. And I begin to pray and I begin to war against those spirits. And as I did, God spoke to me and said, I want you to write them down now. Because I don't want you to get in the way. And I prayed all morning and asked God to release me from having to say this. But he wouldn't let me go. We were battling in this church and in the world in general. Career over the kingdom of God. Carnality over spirituality. Success over sacrifice. Amusement and entertainment over prayer and dedication. Pride over apostolic worship. If the only time we worship is when we have the stage or when we're in front of people, we aren't worshiping, we are performing. And I'm here to tell this church, you can keep your performance. You can keep it to yourself. I want authentic apostolic worship that moves heaven, that shakes the foundation of this community. I don't care if every note is perfect. I don't care if everything is in place. I want somebody that worships when they're with God by themselves. I don't care if you can worship up here. Can you worship when you're in prayer? Can you worship when you're by yourself? Do you sold out to the kingdom of God? <laughs> Give me authentic worship from a sold out life any day over a performance. Why? Because just singing songs isn't going to move God and isn't going to move individuals. But there's something that happens when there's a sold out life that's consecrated to God that says, you know what? This isn't just coming because I'm in front of people. I'm sold out to this thing. And I live a lifestyle 24 hours a day. Every day of the week, I live a lifestyle of worship to God. We have to learn to hear the voice of God. Can I tell you, the voice of God may ask you to do something that your flesh doesn't like. The voice of God may ask you to do something that those around you may think is crazy. It may ask you to take a chance. 
and step out of your ordinary. But we got to be willing to trust the Holy Ghost that God has placed inside of us. My grandpa used to tell me all the time, he would say, I would be, he passed away when I was 17, but when I was a kid, we'd be riding along in the truck with my dad and I'd be sharing dreams and I would be telling him things I wanted to do. And he would always just say this, Scott, trust your Holy Ghost radar. Trust that. When you feel that nudge of the Holy Ghost, don't ignore it. We've got to get, man, if we want apostolic revival, like we keep talking about and we keep praying about, if we want 500 new souls in this church, it isn't going to happen, Reggie, because we open the door on Sunday. It isn't going to happen because we have the best music. (laughs) If we want true apostolic revival when we're walking through Walmart and we feel the nudge of the Holy Ghost say, you need to talk to that lady. You need to pray for that lady. If we really want it, it's going to inconvenience us. Our time schedule, we can't book every moment of the day and say, I've got my mom, I've got my calendar filled from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed with everything that this world tells us we have to do. No, we're going to have to put some things and create some space to where if God tells us to move, we've got the freedom and the opportunity to move. If God tells us it's time to pray, we can take time and pray. If God tells us that we've got to pray for that individual that's sick and we don't even know what what's going on but we're walking down the road and God says you ask them if they need prayer we've got to be willing to pray in Acts chapter 3 right after the day of Pentecost Peter and John are walking up into the temple and the man sitting there saying alms for the poor and he looked on them expecting to receive from them the Bible says And Peter and John just looked at them and said, you know what? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. Give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. Peter and John were doing what they always did. They were going to the temple to pray. They could have walked right past that man laying there and just said, oh, I've seen him before. He's been there. You know what? That guy's there every day asking for money. But after they received the Holy Ghost, there was something inside of them that said, I can't pass up that person in need. I can't pass up that person. I may not have what they're asking for, but I've got something so much greater than what they're asking for. In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And can I tell you what happened? That lame man got up and he took up his bed and he began to walk. And the Bible tells us that when he entered, that his ankle bones received strength. And it said that he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. You say, I don't know if leaping and I don't know if dancing and I don't know if all that is appropriate in the house of God. Let me tell you something. You let God heal you and you'll realize real quick that there's something that I've got to praise him for. You, If you can't walk, let God heal your leg and let you get up and start walking and I'll tell you what you'll do. You'll come into this place saying, I wasn't able to do this before. I wasn't able to worship this way before. So I've got to give him everything I have. It may look crazy to everybody else, but can I tell you what it is? It's gratefulness that God has healed you. Yeah. But the problem was that wasn't the end of the story because not everybody was happy that the lame man was leaping and running and dancing. And so they took Peter and John and they brought them before the courts. And they said, 
This, they're, they're disturbing us. They're, they're causing all this ruckus. They're, they're doing all this stuff. They're, they're healing people. They're, and they're not even supposed to be doing that. They're, they're, they're causing all this chaos. They're causing all this, this situation. They're, 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 they're messing up our whole lifestyle. You know, we've got this pretty church. We, we've got this beautiful temple. We don't want people messing up our place. We don't want people disturbing what goes on in here. We, do, we don't want that kind of stuff going on here. And so they begin to accuse Peter and they begin to accuse the apostles but when you get down in Acts chapter 4 verse 7 it said and when they had set them in the midst they asked by what power and by what name have you done this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, he was intoxicated with something. He was under the influence of something greater than himself. And he said to them under the influence of the Holy Ghost, ye rulers and the people and the elders of Israel, if we this day examine the good done to the impotent man, by what means he was made whole, be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead even by him doth this man stand here now this is the stone which the builder said it not which has become the head of the corner but then he says this neither is there salvation in any other name because there is no other name given under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and you know what they did the very next verse, verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. But look at the next part. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I, I, I know this may sound controversial to some in this room, and I'm not trying to be offensive. But can I tell you, I don't care if everybody in this world thinks that I'm uneducated, I'm unlearned, I'm ignorant. I don't care what they think about me. The only thing I want them to see is I have been with Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter what my education status is. It doesn't matter how, how much the world thinks of me. The only thing that matters is have I been with Jesus? And if I've been with Jesus, the rest of it won't matter because I will have the power of the Holy Ghost. I wonder what would happen if, in, as individuals if we got so intoxicated with purpose and the Spirit that those around us begin to ask what is wrong with him? What's going on with him? Why are they acting like that? Man, I've never seen them act this bold before. I've never seen them witness this much. I've never seen them worship that much. They must have had a little too much of the Holy Ghost. They've had a little too much to drink from that heavenly fountain. They've been with Jesus. You know what? If we want apostolic revival, we have got to get consumed with this thing and we've got to get back to the roots of it and the roots of it is God and him alone being power, powered up by the Holy Ghost Paul, Paul looked at the church in Galatians and he said this he said are you so foolish having begun in the spirit you now are made perfect by the flesh when God filled you with the Holy Ghost, that wasn't your flesh. When God delivered you from drugs and alcohol, and when God took you out of an immoral lifestyle and he set you free, that wasn't you, that was God. How is it we think now that we don't have to rely on God and we can put the spirit on the back burner and do it under our own power? We are not able to live this life without the power of the Holy Ghost in our life. We cannot possess that which we are not willing to pursue. The supernatural doesn't just happen. No, we've got to go after it. We've got to seek after it. But can I tell you something ironic? When you look up the word supernatural in the scripture, it's not there. Why? Because the supernatural was natural. 
to those in the book of Acts. It was natural. It happened. Raising the dead, seeing people healed, seeing miracles happen, laying hands on people and watching them be filled with the Holy Ghost. That was all in the book of Acts, and it wasn't supernatural. It was natural. The reason it's supernatural now is because our natural flesh has taken over our lives to the point that we can't operate in the Spirit the way we want to and the way God desires to. If we ever get to the place that our flesh takes a backseat to the Spirit of God, we will begin to have the supernatural happen on a regular basis to the point that it's not rare when someone walks out of here with their deaf ear open or their blinded eyes open or they walk out of here healed by the power of the Holy Ghost where cancer falls off of them, where they're set free from addiction, where you know what? It shouldn't be abnormal to see that happen. That should be what happens in an apostolic church every Sunday. As the music comes, I want to be totally intoxicated with the presence of God. I want to chase after his presence and his glory in a way that an addict needs a fix. Where are you going? Where are you going? Uh, oh, you know, I, I've got to get there again. I've got to get to his presence again. Well, well you know why? You, you can't leave work early like that. No, no, no. i got to get to his presence again. You know why? Why, why, why are you t- spending all that money? Why are you giving all that to the church? I want to be in his presence. I, I've, got, I've just got to be in his presence. I've just got to be in his presence. I, I need it, whatever it takes. Whatever I have to give up, I need that Holy Ghost in my life. I need the presence of God I'll do whatever it takes whatever it takes to see his glory whatever it takes to get into his presence whatever it takes we've got to get passionate we've got to get radical about this thing God isn't coming back for a church that's laid back resting in their couch or resting in their recliner. No, God is coming back for a church that is on fire, that is consumed with purpose, that is consumed with passion for the kingdom of God. We got to get consumed with it. God, I pray right now that you consume us. God, overshadow us with your presence. God, help us to step out of the ordinary and into your presence. God, help us to begin to operate in a new realm of the Spirit of God. Ah. If you've never received the Holy Ghost in this place, can I tell you His Spirit is here right now? All you have to do is say, God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry for every sin I've ever committed. God, I ask you to wash me, cleanse me. And then you lift your hands and you begin to worship him. And God will fill you with his spirit. You'll begin to speak in a heavenly language that you never learned. But God's spirit will overshadow you. And will fill you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. It's here if you want it.
have a word for someone in this place. There's someone here who's tempted to leave this place and go right back to the frustration you came into this house with, trying to figure it out. And the Lord just spoke to me and said, if that person will just get lost in my presence, I already have the miracle waiting. And they will see that I'm in control. I don't know who I'm speaking to right now, but if you have a need in your life and I'm speaking to you and you're feeling weighed down and trying to figure it out, I want you to come forward right now. I don't know who I'm talking to because he just gave us a promise. Come on. I don't know where you're at. Come on. You know who I'm talking to. You can have an exhausting week if you want, but he just gave us a promise. And this is all you have to do to be absolutely consumed by him in this moment. So what I want you to do is close your eyes, lift your hands to heaven for that one who didn't come because you're worried what people are gonna think. I'm calling to you right now. Lift your hands to heaven and just begin to worship him with everything you've got and become consumed by him right now. Like the day of Pentecost, they didn't care who was watching them. They didn't care how loud it was. They didn't care how wild it was. They were consumed. They were under the influence. Someone right now, would you allow him to consume you completely? Not just part of you, but all of you right now. Consume all of my mind, all of my heart, all of my spirit. Oh, someone's getting there right now. Someone's breaking through right now. You don't have to have those chains on you. You can be delivered in Jesus' name. In this very moment, there are miracles in this house. In this moment, God is here to bring you peace. In Jesus' name, consume my mind. Consume my heart. Consume everything.
Jesus' name. I need every husband and wife to find each other right now. We're going to pray for each other. Quickly find your spouse. Jesus. marriage represented here if one is consumed and the other is not there's disunity and there has to be absolute unity in every marriage join me I need us to pray that it wouldn't just be my wife who wants to be consumed and me stubborn and trying to do my own way or the opposite. And I'm, I'm telling you, there's, there's a power in what we're talking about because you see this affects other lives. I, I know I'm speaking to a spirit right now, I'm trying to divide families. Close your eyes right now in the name of Jesus right now consume us together come on pray you can't let doubt come in you can't let a bunch of mess come in come on don't let that into your home don't allow things to come into your home that you don't want your kids to consume come on in the name of Jesus consume me all over again God covering over every home, every marriage, all the disunity that is trying to be invaded into our homes. We bind you, Satan. We are not giving you a voice. You don't have a choice, but you have to leave your grip on these marriages right now in the name of Jesus. We hate you. You are a father of lies. We bind you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, you have to flee. Let us become humble, Lord, before you today. Jesus is not about us. Let not our pride consume our hope our marriages, our jobs, our children. Let us become completely humble before you. We need you, Jesus. We cannot do anything without you. Without you, we are nothing, nothing at all in the dirty rags. But with you, God, we have hope. Restore joy, God, into our homes, God, into our children.
never forget talking to an addict. She had just come to the church and God was working in her life. And she said, Pastor Johnson, what you have to understand about my addiction was I got to the point where I, I really didn't want it anymore. But if I didn't have it, I got really sick. I couldn't live without it. In the same way, I, I pray to God, we're so addicted to his presence. That, that if I'm not in his presence some morning, there's something wrong. I, I, I got to get back to my source. Rob, this week, as you drive that truck, what the preacher said today is this. Someone this week should look at you and say, he's been with Jesus. That means when that person cuts you off and you just smile and say, praise Jesus. They know you've been with Jesus, right? That means that coworker you really don't like, hmm? Uh, that means when you're in difficult situations and you don't react the way they think you're going to react, he's got to have been with somebody. I want them to know I've been with Jesus. Why don't we thank Brother Senior for speaking a powerful word. A powerful word. An all-consuming fire. Turn your neighbor right now, encourage them. Have a wonderful holiday tomorrow. God bless you. Thank you for being here. I know you could have just stayed home and got ready for the barbecue tomorrow, but you came to the house of God. Encourage someone. Encourage someone.